I can tell you. It's not that I'm in denial about what's going on inside my body. Inside my body. I can also tell you. I don't really mind having ovaries. Or a womb. It's these things in front of my chest. The presence of these things in the past has caused me constant distress. Caused me feelings of depression. And an overwhelming, overbearing feeling of not quite belonging. So, when I ask to be referred to as the... Be referred to as... as referred to as they... It's only to fool my unconscious mind and kind of distract me from what's going on in front of my body and sort of shield you from what's happening behind closed doors. It's like I'm a hard drive plugged, plugged into an incompatible computer. I can't reboot the software. Switching out the hardware is my only option. If I could reprogram myself to be content with what was going on in front of here, I would. I can't reboot the software because I don't want to take pills. I don't want expensive surgeries. Pills. Expensive surgeries. I just want to reboot my hard drive. Reboot expensive hard drive. surgeries. I don't want to take don't want pills. To take pills. I don't want expensive, don't want expensive surgeries. Expensive surgeries. I just want to reboot the hard drive. I don't want to take pills. I just want to reboot my hard drive. I don't drive. want expensive surgeries. I just want to reboot the hard drive. I don't want to take pills. Whoa, 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 whoa. Expensive surgeries. Reboot the hard drive. Reboot the hard drive. I don't want to take pills. I don't want expensive whoa, 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 whoa. surgeries. I just want to reboot the hard drive. Just pills. I don't want to take pills. Pills. I don't want to take pills. Expensive surgeries. Just want to reboot the hard drive. I'm sorry, but no, you say the wrong thing. I'm sorry if you put your no, foot I, right I'm, in it. I'm sorry. No, our immediate I'm sorry response. No, I'm sorry. No, is I'm to sorry. Say, no, I'm sorry. sorry. No, I'm 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 sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. 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 Sorry, 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 sorry,
being. What happens then? Stuck I'm in sorry. an infinite loop of apology. I am just where there's no so change. Sorry. There's no progress. Nothing happens. And then what are we left with? Hello there everyone, welcome to our penultimate session of the In Out Crowd Festival this week in honour of LGBTQ plus History Month. We are back at our usual time this evening, which as a bit of a night owl, nocturnal, badger type person hybrid, I am very much feeling more awake today than I was yesterday. Um, although having said that, yesterday's show was fantastic and tonight's is going to be no different. We began the show there with a wee video that yours truly was starring in, you're very welcome, and that was also um, choreographed and edited by the wonderful Thomas Small, who is in our studio audience today as well. Tonight we're going to be looking at the subject of identity and how we feel comfortable in our identity and the sort of journey to get there. Later on we have got the fantastically fabulous drag artist and dancer Jake Evans who's going to be doing a wee Vogue commercial fusion and we talk a little bit about the history of Vogue and how that helps people find community and find identity and that's something that as I mentioned this film is also based on. So we started off by pre-Covid era, don't worry, there was plenty of bleach involved even still. We started off by choreographing around the subject of trans and non-binary people using gendered bathrooms. So as you saw me kicking about uh, in urinals and next to toilets and there was definitely a toilet brush like right up against my back at one point but it's all for the art darling so you're very welcome. And we were taking articles that we've read, blogs that we've read from lots of different non-binary and trans perspectives on using bathrooms and the gendered language around bathrooms and also the, the strange fear and sometimes straight out hatred um, and, and aggression that people can receive when using bathrooms. Um, there were stories that we'd read of even cis female uh, people who looked more masculine, whatever that means, that were receiving a lot of hate for using a, a women's toilet and then vice versa. So it was only amplified when people who were actually non-binary and trans that were that were experiencing these sorts of things as well. So we looked at that and explored the feelings of lots of different people because we're all different and it's really difficult to use your own experience to be a catch-all for everyone's experience. So it was quite difficult to read all of these different incidents that had happened to people but at the same time it was really refreshing to realize that you know you're not alone when you when people have these sorts of experiences that actually it's unfortunately it is a recurring theme for a lot of trans and non-binary people and as you can see I am once again clad in my two different colors because I only did the one color on Monday so I'm having to play catch up Tonight I'm wearing the yellow and the pink and there's a little bit of a history all about the yellow and the pink and all the other colours. So we're going to take a wee bit of a deeper look as we check out our word of the sleigh. Oh, there we go. A wee bit of a delay, but it's all right. Delay of the sleigh. Now, of course, it's not so much a word of the sleigh, but more of an object of the sleigh of the day. So the pride flag as a whole, where does it come from? Well, to start off, these two colours represent different things, as we'd already mentioned. So yellow, although it's more of a mustard, but just ignore that. Yellow represented sunlight. And I think that that's true of even this era, because we absolutely know how to light up a dance floor. And originally, this would have been hot pink rather than pale pink. Hot pink in the original version of the Pride flag, um, which you can't actually see in the one behind me, but if you uh, were to see any of the typical rainbow flags just with the plain stripes on them, the hot pink represented sex. And that's it. <laughs> now, of course, non-heterosexual sex um, was regarded as a sin, which we've also discussed on the In Out crowd before. It was illegal at one point as well, even in the UK. 
and it was something to be ashamed of and even today straight relationships in, in straight relationships, sex is still something that isn't really spoken of. Um, as Mamoru had mentioned yesterday, it's something that people feel sometimes quite nervous to talk about. They don't know how to bring it up. It feels a bit awkward. Still very much a taboo. So the hot pink in the original pride flag symbolised our freedom of sexuality and our freedom of feeling pride in our sexuality as well. Now, between 1978 and 1979, the hot pink was removed simply due to unavailability of fabric. There you go. But that wasn't too long after the original pride flag was actually created. So the origins of it was Gilbert Baker, who was an openly gay activist born in 1951, grew up in Kansas and went on to even serve in the US Army for a few years around 1970. After an honourable discharge, Gilbert taught himself how to sew, and in 74 he met Harvey Milk, an influential gay leader who, three years later, challenged Baker to come up with a symbol of pride for our LGBTQ plus community. The original pride flag flew at the San Francisco Gay Freedom Day Parade celebration, which was on June 25th, 1978. Listen to me hitting out with all these dates here. I've done my research, so I have. Before this pride, it was actually the pink triangle, which was used as a symbol for the queer movement. This represented a dark chapter in the history of same-sex rights. The pink triangle was created by the Nazis during World War II to identify and stigmatise homosexuals their words, in the same way that the Star of David was used um, against Jews and others, um, sorry, used against Jews and other people that unfortunately were targets of uh, the Nazi regime. It functioned as a tool of oppression and whilst our community tried to take the pink triangle and use it as a symbol of power and pride, Harvey Milk and others didn't want to use this symbol anymore. So that's why it had been suggested that Baker um, should come up with a, an alternative symbol that didn't have quite as dark a history and something that we could move forward with pride. And it's been suggested that Baker may have been inspired by Judy Garland's song Over the Rainbow and the Stonewall riots that happened just a few days after Garland's death, which, as we mentioned um, the other week at the In Out Crowd, was, of course, a massive icon for the LGBTQ plus community. Another suggestion for how, the rain, for how the rainbow flag originated is that at college campuses during the 1960s, some people demonstrated world peace by carrying an original flag of the races, also called the flag of the human race, with five horizontal stripes from top to bottom, and they were red, white, brown, yellow and black. However, in modern day society, we can understand why that is something that may have been in poor taste, and so that's why they stuck with the rainbow flag. The first rainbow flags were commissioned by the fledgling Pride Committee and were, in, and were produced by a team led by Baker that included um, multiple artists and other queer activists at that time. So we've already mentioned some of the original colours, however I will just rattle them off for you now. So the hot pink represented sex, red represented life, orange represented healing, yellow represented sunlight, green represented nature, turquoise represented magic and art, and indigo represented serenity. However, as we mentioned earlier on this week, those some of those colours are no longer part of the pride flag, such as turquoise and blue, which have been turquoise and indigo, which have been merged together to create blue. And there's also been the addition of other hues of the colour, such as light blue and light pink for the trans flag. Now, in June 2018, there was a designer called Daniel Kozar, um, and Z re released a redesign incorporating elements from both the Philadelphia Pride flag and the Trans Pride flag, which is what you see behind me now, including the Progress Chevron. So tonight, I'm wearing, tonight, the colour that I'm wearing is the light pink to represent the part of the Trans flag. And we believe here at the Unout Crowd and Shaper Caper that particularly for trans and non-binary siblings, massive change must still be made. And that is why the Progress Chevron, which you can see here on my right hand side, is something that we celebrate and we are thankful that that is part of our flag that we would fly at Prides nowadays. Because yes, it's showing how far we've come. It's also paying homage to those who fought for us to get to this space in the first place. And it's also showing the direction that we're travelling in, which is hopefully forward. And that has been your word of the sleigh. 
So I would like to just bring in my team that are kind of lurking away in the background there. And let's just have a wee conversation about it. Did you learn something today? Was this something that you already knew? And do you have any thoughts on the multiple iterations of the flag that we've had so far? Eleanor, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I mean, I knew about all the different colours because I've done a research project of my own about them. I know. <laughs> um, I'm not doing a hot topic for no reason here. Um, but uh, I didn't really think about the triangle um, part of it as the direction of moving forward, uh, but also potentially looking back and so on. And I think that's a really lovely way of looking at it. So yeah, that part's new for me. Uh, lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you actually, because um, I, of course I did some research too, glasses, imaginary glasses, but um, when I was doing some research on the Progress Chevron, there was actually quite a lot of controversy about it. Some people had thought that changing the pride flag from its original kind of six colour flag that, that we would normally see was kind of, um, was a... Uh, what's the word, not um, offensive, but sort of not really paying homage to the original movement. Um, I mean, my personal viewpoint in that is, as we saw from the, the origins of the six colours, the colours have changed throughout decades. You know, they've kind of merged colours, they've added colours, they've taken them away. So I don't really see it as something that's, you know, kind of desecrating the original flag. I think it's like building on it and creating some new building blocks. I'm seeing you nod there, Tommy. Is that something that you agree with? <laughs> I know, I think I'm like a nodding dog or something. I just feel like I just... I... <laughs> I'm always like, I'm always like, totally like Chuck Chuck. Oh, I mean, um, not experiments, I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, no, I, I tot totally agree. Um, it's interesting with, um, you know, another hat on. Well, I mean, I have to wear loads of hats nowadays because my hair is like, oh, it's a pure nightmare. I've not had a cut in about a year. Um, but wearing another hat, I, as well as working at Shape of Caper, I'm co-chair of Dundee Pride. And it's something we've been looking at as well is about kind of use the, the rainbow flag is kind of embedded in the design of our logo. And we, we made the decision um, kind of last year that, that actually we should really adopt the, um, the the kind of Chevron as well. So we then started kind of rebranding um, and have reflected that now on our website and stuff. So yeah, I think I think it's really interesting the, the kind of the idea of kind of change. You know, Becky Kaufman said that really brilliantly a couple of days ago um, um, from the Scottish Trans Alliance about, you know, people's reactions to change and about how people find it really difficult to change. Um, but it's it's just so it's just so interesting though that people you know you were talking earlier about that forward direction of travel and some people are on a very very slow journey but even if it's just like you know like iceberg slow as long as it's moving forward we're okay i think it's when it actually just you know starts going the opposite direction as when we've got trouble but some people i think are more adept to change than others so yeah, yeah. I think that's it. I think especially with the, the adoption of the, the black and brown stripes and also the, the trans, I'm just kind of gesturing here, I feel like I'm on a weather map, and also <laughs> the trans flag. You know, to me, it's the, it's the same reason that I think it's great to include pronouns in our Zoom names, you know, because if your pronouns, if someone would kind of assume you were female and you go with she, her pronouns, well then great. But when, if you're, you know, like Helena and Eliana have got their news well, Tom, you've got your she, her and your he, him, it just, it's like going that extra step for inclusivity. You know, it's like, it would be great if it was just a catch-all. Yeah, everyone's included. But when you just go that extra step to sort of, you know, highlight certain colours that need highlighted or highlight certain things, it just makes it a more comfortable space for everybody. And I think that's what's really important. I would also say, though, that the other thing that I think is really, really important for our community that I think we sometimes forget is that people might not know. So people might have no clue whatsoever. There's no ill intention, but just simply don't realise that things have changed, that things are changing. Some people, you know, for they're still, um, you know, kind of use of pronouns, some people still struggle with that. But I think it's because they, they, it's not that there's necessarily a hatred. Of course, there are some people that are, but, you know, thinking about the best in people. Um, some people, for them, it's just that they haven't ever considered it. They've never thought about it. Um, so sometimes, you know, using um, kind of other pronouns might, for some people, be like, oh, I need to actually really kind of work at doing that. And I think as long as people are, with their best intentions, trying their best um, to do things, um, then I think, you know, and it's kind of what I was saying earlier about change, that it's it's hard for people to make change and i think as long as they're attempting to make change i think it's okay and i think our community really um embraces that i think i think it's just about making sure that we are giving a space for people to to, to learn and that some people that might be a slow journey getting there as long as you're getting there and you're trying then that's all we need really isn't it 
So like hop on the sleigh, you'll get there a whole <laughs> lot faster. <laughs> Eliana, do you have any thoughts on the kind of history of the pride flag and even some of the conversations that we were having just there? Yeah, um, I wanted to pick up on what Tommy said. I think um, in and out crowd is so important to make that change forward. And I think that with every episode you guys do, you honestly spread education out to the world. And I think what you're doing is really important. Um, yeah, and also uh, on the colors of the pride flag, I think it really represents the community. It really shows like, the vibrant, um, the positivity, and yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, it would just, you know, it'd be a little bit boring if, you know, our flag was just, it just stayed the same, you know, it's got to change. You're like, we've all gone through changes. And I think particularly over the last year, you know, I think we've seen just how important it is to really give a special shout out and pay special homage to particularly the trans community and especially um, who the black and how the black and brown I can't speak today, who the black and brown stripes represent as well, because it's not just that black lives matter and trans lives matter, but black trans lives matter and black queer lives matter. And you know, unfortunately some we've discussed in the NL crowd before is um, on, on the last part of research that I did, um, the average life expectancy for a black trans woman in the USA is 35, which is just, it's, it's awful and it's shocking. And I think that especially because that is the community that is pushing us this way from way back when, I think, yeah, we've absolutely got to, got to give them credit for their hard work. And speaking of hard work, Next up, we have the incomparable Jake Evans, who is a dancer and drag artist, who's put together a little bit of a fusion piece of art to share with us as they come on to slay the stage.
the end. Oh my god, that was amazing! I was like sitting like with my video off, like yes, and what the head and what the shoulder. Oh, fantastic! Oh, what a what a way, what a way to like thank you. What you do. So, for anyone who has just watched that magnificentness and doesn't know who you are, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit? Because I know you, but everybody watching might not. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, hi, I'm Jake Evans and I'm a dance artist based in Leeds. Um, I'm also a drag performer. Um, I'm also in a Vogue house called the House of Decay. Um, yeah, so started performing, I can't even remember now, when I was 17. And yeah, trained and then was touring some shows before the pandemic, um, which has canceled all the gigs. So <laughs> here I am right now, yeah. Fab, so yeah, we have worked with um, you Jake before on some contemporary work. Um, yes. Where did the vogue kind of that sort of style come in for you? Was that something that you've, you've held throughout your kind of contemporary training or was that something you fell into after? Uh which is really strange. It, it, it kind of all fell into place for me after I finished training, actually. Um, roundabout, so I did, I did a postgraduate degree. So I should say I trained at Northern School of Contemporary Dance in Leeds. Um, and then I did the postgraduate, which was Verve, which is their company that make works and then tour the country. And then after that, I did the extra add-on module to make it a master's degree. And for that, I did my own self-directed project, which was the most stressful three months of my life. And after that, I kind of hated dancing. So I took a break, then auditioned for lots of jobs. I did Megabus back and forth to London. Um, for a few months, then got my first job, then started doing drag that summer, then got my first drag performance gig, then got asked to join the house, um, then started working at a club. So, so that, that year in 2017 was like, everything came together. So um, I, and that was the, around about the time I was hanging out more with queer people. Like I'd found that queer space in Leeds, which was more alternative and like, I found my people, I guess. Um, so everything kind of clicked into place then. So it was, it, was long, it was long after training actually, which is a shame because I would have loved to have combined it like I just did then in, in in uh, training but anyway no i think it's lovely i think you know the two different styles of contemporary style and also sort of vogue they seem very different but really at the kind of core of it it's like self-expression and it's very artistic and i think that the the way that you perform them they complement really well together and um, do you find that when you're like making these kind of pieces or is it quite a challenge for you to merge the two it's it's a challenge well um saying that actually the more i the more i do different types of dancing the more i think it's kind of all the same what you're putting on top of it is this is the style um the music the the details the costume whatever but if you're just moving a body your body in an in an expressionist way um so yeah, the more I do it, the more I like try and be inspired by like every single thing I do. It's the same with like physical theatre, um, commercial, hip hop stuff. Um, yeah, and making, I don't get a lot of opportunity to combine everything the way I want to. So to do this thing right now has been great for me. It was even better for us watching. We're like, wow, <laughs> exactly. Especially because, like, you know, we've I've not been to any sort of space to see, like, you know, just having those spaces shut because of the pandemic, where you would just see people moving like that, like on a Saturday night, and it was just, you know, you would be like, oh my god, that could be on the stage. So I was getting a bit emotional, almost like watching you do it, because I was like, I can't wait to be back. And oh, that's so nice. 
Yeah, honestly, I can't wait either. It's, you know, it's funny because when we, when lockdown began, I was like, oh, give it a few months and then um, Pride is going to be great. The summer is going to be amazing. It's going to be full of love and hugging and joy. <laughs> and it just... Not yet. <laughs> I think back to, the, to what, the way I talked, like, last year. I was completely... No idea, no clue. <laughs> well, with that though, I mean, obviously you've been making use of the time and like putting together that piece for us there is just, is, again, thank you so much for doing that. Um, most people who maybe know about Vogue, maybe seen it on, you know, Drag Race or Impose or something, and or, or Madonna as well, as Tommy always likes to point out, um, her kind of, you know, commercialising it and to bring it into the mainstream. Um, how do you think that there's a difference between the sort of traditional American style Vogue where it all started versus the kind of houses that we see in the UK and in Europe? Is there a big difference for you or is it kind of quite a similar feel? Um, there's... Uh, there is, well, the main difference, I guess, is the scene in the UK is, it's, it's a baby, it's a baby scene. Obviously in America is where it all began in like the, the late 70s, 80s, and then the people there started, to, well, obviously people watched music videos and that's how it became international. And then the Vogue's in America would travel and then teach, um, people all over the world basically and they would set up like their own chapters so house of ninja would have a chapter in like another country and that's usually how it works um in the uk the sea is pretty tiny in comparison to america but even in comparison to like um, um the, the netherlands and like france mm -hmm. yeah the, the scenes there are huge and in, in the UK is pretty small in comparison. So I would say that's probably the biggest difference and that there's less of a tradition and there's less of a, uh, less of a rule book that everyone knows to follow, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So when people put on their own Vogue events, it definitely has a UK kind of flavor to it, I would say. Fab. So I've yeah. mentioned that you're part of a house, a Vogue house called the House of Decay. If someone was to go along to a House of Decay performance um, or event, what would we expect to see? <laughs> um, um, sex. <laughs> oh, is that sex. what I want to see? <laughs> or, uh, mm, lots, lots of... Uh, I don't, lots of fire, I would say. Um, what else, what do we do? Lots of risque stuff, I would say. Pushing, pushing the envelope in your face. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe it offends you. Ooh. Maybe it makes you think. It's political, it's sexy. Yeah, we are very political, very sex positive. Very, um, we think it's important to know your history, know your queer culture and fight, uh, fight for trans rights, basically. Mm -hmm. Because without trans people, there would be no pride. Without trans people, there'd be no voguing in the way we know it. Yeah, uh, black trans people especially. So, so sort of all that meshed into a performance. That's really amazing. Yeah, and any, anyone who follows Jake on um, on social media, um, you have been very vocal, particularly um, recently, about uh, Black trans lives and Black Lives Matter and the importance of kind of protecting um, trans people in in all aspects of life, not just kind of with the recent, there's been like some hate crime um, bill reform in Scotland um, and there's been a lot of discussion on that in the news and such. Um, yeah. You talk about knowing your history, that is there anything that you can kind of, I'll just kind of discuss that a little bit more about, you know, the importance of history in Vogue, certainly kind of how you perform it um, for, for me is that I do see a lot of that kind of passion about our history coming through um, in your performance um, and just yeah like the the importance of that if someone's watching going yeah well we know it's important but how important is it really what would you say to someone that maybe needs to know how important it is well I would say that um, the whole language of Vogue and of ballroom 
that originated in, in Harlem in New York in the 80s. That whole lexicon of uh, fierce, slay, uh, queen, um, get your tens, um, all those things are originated with ballroom. And we wouldn't know it today because obviously Drag Race has kind of exploded that whole language. But that, it didn't start on Drag Race, it started in, in those places in New York, which were marginalized queer people, um, black, trans, uh, Latinx. Um, a lot of them were homeless because they got kicked out. Um, a lot of them were, had no money. A lot of them were um, HIV positive. A lot of them were sex workers. So, and they all grouped together because they were experiencing, experiencing all this oppression. And Vogue came out of that as kind of like a, a celebration of everything that society told you was wrong about you, your personality or your life. In those places, you could celebrate it. And, um, sorry, what was, I was gonna say something else as well. It's also a protest as well. So it's, a, Vogue is a celebration of yourself but also is a protest dance against society as well. And so all of that culture was, uh, was very small, it was very involved. And now obviously it's exploded internationally throughout the world. And, and we all love it so much. We, we can't wait to, to watch the next episode of Drag Race. We all wanna go to see the Queens. We wanna go to our local drag park bar and support the queens there it's the whole thing and it's so great and we owe, we owe a lot a lot a lot of that to um the ballroom scene in the 1980s and further to that um we owe a lot of our um pride protesting the parades the marches to uh the the queens in the 1960s who, who originated the, uh, the Pride Parade, which was a protest in its original form. And so it's important to know that and to never forget, because in a lot of places, we, we think it's quite comfortable here in the West, um, in, in the UK, in, in the US, but elsewhere, like in Turkey, in Poland, um, Russia, um, these places, in Hungary, these places where now they, they've they're completely like drawing back on so many uh, freedoms for queer people and sort of as a, of a reaction against the, the way the, the West and Brit has embraced it in a lot of ways and has sort of furthered the, the amount of freedom, the amount of uh, political freedom that we have. It doesn't exist for a lot of people. And they, they say, oh, this is a Western thing. Um, we don't have that here. It's, it's a Western ideology. Um, it doesn't exist. We have no queer people. And it's just, it completely invalidates a lot of people's lives and experiences. And I think we need to remember that when we celebrate ourselves because people are still fighting all over the world and we should fight for them. It's very similar to white people or non-black people fighting for um, Black Lives Matter because when uh, a, a group have freedom, then it lifts us all up. We, we all can experience more freedom that way and not, not stand on people or knock people down. So yeah, I think that's why it's important to know your history, know your references, yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself, Jake. I'm just sitting there like, yes, yes. My yeah. God, electricators <laughs> yeah. all over the world. My God. So I'm going to put you on the spot a wee bit here. Uh, yeah. Anyone who's watching who saw your piece and went, oh my God, that was incredible. I wish I could do that, but I don't think I can. Would you be up for showing us just maybe a little, a little eight count or so of like some little Vogue moves just in the upper body that anyone watching could just kind of do? Yeah, absolutely. Now? Yeah, just arms or something, and I'll join in. I'll join in. See if I can move. Yeah, it I'll go with the most obvious. Okay. Yeah. You've probably seen this a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not that. Never do that. 
never ever do that. So the way the way I like to do it is um, this way. So this is I should explain. This is like in Vogue firm. So there's lots of elements of Vogue or categories, I should say. Dance wise, there's old way, there's new way, and there's Vogue fan. And in Vogue fan, there's lots of there's five elements. That is hand performance, which I did a bit of, um, duck walk, floor work, spins and dips, and runway. So I'm going to do a little bit of hand performance, which is your typical this. Yeah. So it's just. Um, you've got your middle finger on your shoulder and your elbow is glued to your other elbow, if that makes sense. And then you just switch, 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 switch. And it's important to keep the wrists very gay. Oh, always. <laughs> I always say it's like you've had your acrylics done and you're going to uh, dry them nice and floppy and limp and so we just do we can go one two and then we circle it three four and then we go the other way one two three four yeah Oh, you really feel it in your sugars, didn't you, when you're doing it properly? <laughs> and actually, it's so hard to get your angles completely, your angles like completely straight. It's, I find it so challenging, especially if you're tightening the shoulders. Um, yeah, and also a lot of Vogue movements, your arms have to be completely straight and break at the wrist. You'd never do that. You never do that because otherwise you're chopped from the category and you get no wins, no tens, no trophies. So nothing. <laughs> Lovely. So if we've gone here, we've done a little circle. Is there anything else we could we could bring in? Yeah, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one, I'll show you because it's another quintessential Vogue move. Um, we could do this. It's very tricky, but I think of it as like a sun. Mm -hmm. You do one sun here and then one sun on the floor. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the sunshine here and then sunshine facing the floor. That's very tricky. It's you're chasing one hand with the other. I hope all of the audience is managing this as well. <laughs> I'm looking through this. You've done this. And then once you get it, you can go faster. And then usually people have it like above the heads. Oh, I'm going to screen. Oh. Here, here, or take it. Yeah. Wow. So it definitely helps to have good wrist action then. Yeah, it's you have to warm up those wrists, get them nice and uh, flexible. Nice and flexy, right? Well, shall we? Let's let's give a let's give a wee bash. And go from the very beginning of, of what you've taught us there. I'll um, yeah. hold on. I'll see if I can get us a wee bit of music in the background. Everybody watching, just yeah, start rehearsing. Will be a test at the end. <laughs> everyone's like stretched at their arms for now it's actually really difficult to do sitting down as well i feel like you need some some space to yeah you notice i 
I find when I sit down, I have to sit on the edge of the chair. I have to sit with a complete straight back. Otherwise, otherwise uh, a lot of arm stuff. Sometimes you have to like, like curve a little bit. So if you're sitting down like on a chair, it's yeah, it's harder. Yes. Well, that was absolutely fantastic, Jake, and hopefully everyone watching is now well versed in Vogue. Um, if people want to catch up with um, what you're doing, is there any particular social media that folk can kind of follow you on and see what you're up to? Um, yeah, so I'm at Jake Daniel Evans on Instagram. I also have a website, which is jakeevans.co.uk. Newly, newly um, produced, so yeah, great. <laughs> So yeah, you can follow me there. Fabulous. Well, we do encourage everyone to follow. And of course, when everything opens back up again, fingers crossed, look out for Jake in a ballroom near you or a drag <laughs> bar near you or a yeah. bar near you. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully very soon. Thanks so much again, Jake. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much to Jake there for his fantastic showing there. And I hope that you're all, you know, working out those arm muscles and uh, hopefully get a nice hot bath because I'm definitely sore after doing that myself. Once again as well, thank you so much to my fabulous team there, Tommy, Ileana and Eleanor for having a chat all about the history of the Pride flag and also where we are headed forward. We will be back tomorrow night for our final instalment of the In Out Crowd Festival and we do hope to see you there over on YouTube's. And with that being said... <laughs>